women created their own scene within punk. And punk really didn't do shit for them. Mm. They did a lot of shit for punk. There was a really equal participation, and as the years went by, that participation uh, started to be to be erased. You know, people just did not write so much about um, the groups that had women in them, or the or just the contributions that women made. There was a girl. The Midals started in 1978. I was cutting hair in my salon on Westheimer, and Linda came in for a for us to cut bangs. She needed, she wanted bangs. Trish was cutting my hair one day when I was I was getting bangs. That was like my exposure to having bangs. And then from then on, it was like we started talking. We were listening to music in her shop and started thinking, you know, this music's pretty lame. I mean, we should just we could do better than that. And Trish said, let's start a band. And I said, you know, that's great, except there's one problem. I don't know how to play an instrument. I said, well, you know, I've taken guitar and piano since I was a kid, so I will teach you <laughs> like I knew something. Um, and, but I, you know, really it was all innocence and um, we just did it. We just said, okay, we're gonna do it. We just, just jumped in and uh, I think that's the spirit of punk rock, is that just, you, you just, without fear, you just do it. When I met Trish, we started going to these punk rock shows all the time, and it was a, a genre of music that I liked anyway. And we would go just every, any night, all night, every night. Uh, it was just what we did. It was where we found our community and our, our voice and, and fun and acceptance. And so I don't know, one day I think, you know, as I recall it, we were in the front of the stage having watched a band that was perhaps not particularly good in our estimation. And uh, we just thought, we can do this, let's, let's try. My cousin Trish called me and said that she had some interest in in having me play with uh, a group of young women that uh, were interested in playing music, um, didn't know their instruments, and it, it seemed to click. It seemed like I added the piece, the ingredient that they were looking for, and so I've been playing with them ever since. And so I'm the drummer of my dolls. <laughs> Trish and, and Linda and Diana and George uh, got together and they started, uh, didn't really have uh, strong music background or if any, and got their instruments and, and just started uh, creating music from scratch. They put a lot of effort into it and it gradually evolved into, into something I would even describe it as beautiful, but it was beautiful in a punk rock sort of way. <laughs> we stand in salute of the almighty American dollar. We'll do anything for an American dollar. We'll even kill your little baby boys and your baby girls, politician. The punk scene was actually very aligned with a lot of political issues going on at the time. There was this creativity emerging and it was, part of it was from a place of anger. There were these social justice issues, these causes that, you know, rock against racism. Uh, there was police brutality and harassment going on in the 1970s in Houston. You know, throwing a Latino guy in a canal and watching him drown, shooting the gay leader in the back of the head or whatever they did at a march, you know. Houston's police had the worst reputation in the country. 
At a joint news conference at City Hall, Mayor McCon and Houston Police Chief Harry Caldwell, just back from Kansas City, discussed the violence that injured four police officers, two newsmen, and sent 29 young people to jail. The mayor said the police showed amazing restraint. For them not to, uh, to go in and just mop up, I think, took a great deal of restraint because, frankly, it was my tendency to go mop up. Our police uh, force in Houston was fairly corrupt. There were a lot of things going on, like people getting thrown in bios, and that kind of drove us to um, be more politically active. We were pissed off, so the, the, I think anger was just driving us again. We were angry, and we wanted to speak out, and we weren't afraid to. The songs that we did back then are completely pertinent to what's happening in the world today. It's amazing how, you know, 40 years pass and it's still the same kind of music, it, the same lyrics fit. It's just a different um, politician maybe that we're talking about or a different, a different country that's being suppressed that we're, that we're talking about. But the music still stands. Indians on the wall. American equality, do you recall the little Indian boy? They shot him dead. No future for the little Indian brave. Hey! I can remember that, um, you know, sometimes during rehearsals at Trisha's house, she would like throw some sort of noisemaker in my hand. And I remember there was one other show that she said, I wrote this song and you have to sing it tonight. And so I had to go out on stage. I saw a picture of it the other day. I was like, oh yeah, that really happened, you know? <laughs> but um, there really was that female mentorship and that really close friendship with women and the really, really supporting each other. They're also the sweetest people in the world because they care and they definitely care about your art. And that is something that's incredibly obvious. They, they want you to feel like you have all the freedom in the world. Um, they've seen me make mistakes, but they've helped lift me up. I am a perpetual outsider. I'm always, you know, swooping into some new community or new situation, new scene. And the experience that I had, initiated very much by, by Trish and Diana, um, and later Linda and George of My Dolls, um, you know, that, that led to this realization that I had that, in fact, my own history in this place ties me to it. It binds me to, it gives me roots that I never really thought I had. I credit them for that. I credit, I credit, I credit, you know, I credit my my dolls for that. She loved him. 